Hello and welcome to today's Aquarian at Home live stream. May the 4th be with all of you. Today is Star Wars Day and in honor of Star Wars Day, we are here. We are trying to rack our brains and figure out which of our animals we could use that would tie into it being Star Wars Day and the best we could come up with that wasn't a moon jelly was the marine toad. And we'll talk a little bit about why the marine toad here in a little bit, but to begin with, let's go ahead and say hello to Susie Grant, who is a frequent uh, presenter on these live streams. Susie, say hello to everyone. Hi, how are y'all today? All right, so Susie, um, what can you tell us about the marine toad? What are some interesting uh, facts about him and his, or them and their natural uh, history? Well, one of the first things you may notice about them is their size. They are actually one of the world's largest species of toads, and they can gain anywhere from, you know, be, they can weigh anywhere from two to about four and a half pounds, maybe up to five pounds. And these two in particular are just under three pounds right now. All right. Now, those of you who are watching, there are a few dozen of you. Thank you very much for joining today's live stream. Uh, as you guys are watching, if you have any questions, make sure you type them down in the comments and I will pass them on to Susie. Now, if they're too Star Wars related, uh, I might have to field them myself because Susie, as it turns out, is not as big of a Star Wars fan as I am, and we won't hold that against her, but I will be happy to pass on any questions that happen to be about, I don't know, science or animals or unimportant things like that on Star Wars Day. Uh, but again, type them down in the comments, so I'll be sure to pass them on. And if, you, if any of you happen to see that little donate button down there on your screen, uh, that directly benefits our Emergency Operations Fund, which is how we are affording to do continue to do things like well i say that it's helping us to pay for caring for the animals and uh, paying staff while we remain closed so that is all uh, benefiting a pretty important cause thank you very much to those of you who have taken the time and uh, to open your wallets and to contribute to that fund uh, in the time that we've been doing these uh, live streams so susie uh where did these guys come from this particular type of frog is native to Central and South America and into the southernmost parts of Texas. You do now find them all over the world as they have been intentionally introduced in some areas to help eat the insects, particularly in the sugarcane fields, which is another one of the common names for them. They're often called a cane toad. They do have a very large appetite and they do feed on a lot of insects, which is why it was thought that they would be a nice biological control. Okay. Uh, so we're, I'm hearing from a few of you that you're having a little bit of trouble hearing Susie. Now that could be my phone. It could be Susie's volume. So I'll just ask Susie if she doesn't mind, she can scream at me and that's okay. I prom I won't hold that against her any more than I hold against that. She doesn't seem to like Star Wars as much as I do. We won't hold that against her. Uh, but I will ask, uh, I'll try and make sure that you guys can hear what she's saying because uh, all this is really interesting stuff. Uh, we got some shout outs from Georgia. It looks like somebody's watching from Sweden. Thank you very much for, for tuning in all the way from Sweden. Uh, that is awesome. Uh, let's see, have we got any questions yet? Uh, Mar Marcy Puglisi, I, again, I'll issue my, my typical, forgive me for mispronouncing names disclaimer at the beginning of this stream because that's bound to happen, but Yes, Marcy, he does look like Jabba the Hutt, and that is actually why we are talking about him today, because as Roger Ebert, uh, the famed film critic, said in his 1983 review of Return of the Jedi, the last of the original trilogy, he referred to the Marine Toad, or referred to Jabba as looking like a cross between a Marine Toad and a Cheshire Cat, which is brilliant writing and a spot-on description of a pretty famous space gangster. So... Good on you for noticing that similarity. Uh, so, Susie, what would these toads be eating uh, out in, in the wild? In their natural habitats, they would be eating lots and lots of different insects and basically anything that they can fit in their mouth. And so they would eat not only the insects, but they would also eat lizards, fro uh, other frogs. They would eat small mammals. Um, like I said, just about anything that they can fit in there in their mouths, which is pretty wide. You know, it goes from way over here all the way around. Um, can you hold your hand down there just for scale so people can appreciate just exactly how big these toads are? And like I said, these toads currently weigh just under three pounds, um, but they can get to be a little bit larger than that, going anywhere from two and a half to five pounds. All right. Now, if any of you have any questions, I was being 
funny about Star Wars, but if you have any questions about toads and, uh, you know, toads have uh, some misconceptions probably about them, some things that uh, are people think to be true that maybe are not true, type those down in the comments and I'll make sure I get those uh, myths debunked for you or confirmed if they happen to be true. Amanda Flat says that five-year-old Miles is watching and says, those are cool animals. I think they're really cool animals too. They're actually, a, a, to me, a very interesting frog and they tend to have, in my opinion, a lot of personality. Um, as you can see, they can sit up nice and straight and tall when they go after their food. They are very attentive to what's going on around them. That's part of what helps keep them safe. How does that keep them safe? Well, because if you look at their color, it kind of gives you an indication of where they might be found. And they tend to be terrestrial or land dwelling. And looking at their color, you can see how they might look like those dead leaves and they would hide amongst those leaves while at the same time looking for some of those insects. All right. Now, when you say insects, I mean, are there any particular kinds of insects that they would go after more often than others? Oh, they are omnivores, which means they will eat just about anything, and they really are not very picky. As I mentioned early on, they were introduced to help eat beetles in the sugarcane fields. However, what we have learned is that as a biological control, they are really not that great, because they do not only eat the insects, but they also are not picky, and they eat the native frog species. They eat the lizards, they eat the snakes, they eat the small mammals, um, and so they really um, are not at all picky. They've even been known to come and eat dog food off of the porch. Wow. So Mark Farber actually comments, uh, has a nice comment that segues from that, which is he says they are a nuisance in many parts of the world. Yes, they are. They um, were intentionally introduced in some areas in the 60s, and within a year or two, they were then deemed a nuisance animal and almost always make the top 100 most um, noxious pest. <laughs> now, do they make good pets? I don't believe that they would make a good pet. I mean, first of all, any animal does much better in its natural habitat. I mean, that when, when we have the knowledge to take care of them, we can oftentimes provide what they need. However, these are nocturnal animals, and so they're going to be most active at night when you're trying to sleep. And they are actually an animal that defends itself using a toxin. And so through their skin, they secrete different types of toxins that can be used as a defense, but that also means that you're not gonna be doing a lot of handling of them. They also have very sensitive skin, and so when we handle them, I make sure that my hands are moist before touching them. They absorb a lot of their moisture and their water through their skin. So it's not an animal that you're gonna be able to really interact a whole lot with. Okay. That actually answers Jill Klein's all caps, I should point out, uh, comment, are they poisonous? Uh, I think she might as well have screamed that. So uh, it sounds like, yes, they are, they are toxic, you said. They are toxic. They do secrete um, poisons through their skins. If you'll notice, they have this large kind of triangular gland here. It's called the parotid gland. Can you and point it out one more time? Sorry, I wasn't looking. There's a large gland here on their shoulders, and they can ooze kind of a milky white substance or a toxin that can actually cause an animal to... Um, vomit, it can cause them to salivate, it can, it can even cause death in some animals fairly quickly, like within 15 minutes. And so, and they are poisonous at every stage of their life, even as a tadpole. So um, it's not necessarily one that I would recommend. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Marcy Puglisi, again, I'm probably just butchering that. Anyway, uh, six-year-old Luca, she says, wants to know, what is the difference between frogs and toads? I'm so glad someone asked this because I was going to ask it myself. Well, that is a great question. And toads are a kind of frog. They're just broken into different categories. But some of the big things that you'll notice about them is that they tend to have shorter back legs in comparison to their bodies. Toads tend to have drier, kind of wartier, or bumpier looking skin. They tend to walk and do shorter hops as opposed to the big long leaps that a lot of the, the true frogs will do. Okay. And then uh, there's also a difference in their eggs, isn't that right? How they lay eggs? A lot eggs? of times, yes. There are toads, like a marine toad like this, can lay anywhere from 8,000 to 30,000 eggs at a time. And they are generally laid in kind of a long string of eggs. Whereas a lot of frogs, their eggs are more in a mass or more like a ball. 
Okay. Uh, Linda Larson says, uh, I know they jump in the pond and splash. Do they swim all around? They can swim. They, they even our two really love to sit in their water. And again, that's because they're going to absorb a lot of that uh, water through their skin. Okay. Uh, Karen Estes would like to know, on behalf of Kirby, can they eat small mammals? They can. They are known to eat things like young mice. An adult one could eat an adult mouse. And um, where this one's sitting, you can easily see that mouth. And so you can open that mouth pretty wide. And like I said, anything that fits inside is considered fair game to him. <laughs> and from this perspective, it really does kind of bring, bring that reference that Roger Ebert made to Jabba the Hutt looking like a marine toad uh, kind of to life. That, that is just a spot on look for, for a hut. Which I find very interesting is Jabba the Hutt liked to eat frogs. <laughs> <laughs> so he may not have been a real fan of the marine toad, though, because of those toxins. All right, so uh, here at the aquarium, uh, can you talk a little bit about the role that, that these toads play? So these are an animal that you, you don't see. If you're just on the, on the exhibit path, you, you would not find these in one of our exhibits in one of the galleries. So what, what role do they play here? Our marine toads are one of our education ambassador animals. That means that they come out to do programs for school groups or for visitors, just in general, for camp groups. Um, you have the opportunity to meet an animal like this. They're ones that go out into the public. And our education ambassador animals help us to give people a better understanding of animals that share this planet with us. All right, and people uh, might wonder, since we've already talked a little bit about the fact that these uh, particular toads can be a problem in some parts of the world, they might wonder, why then is it worth us showcasing them? Why, why are they worth talking about and, and serving in that ambassadorial role that you just talked about? Well, for a really wide variety of reasons, they do play an important role in their ecological or in their native habitats. And so each animal has an ecological niche that they fill. It means they have a job that they do. And one of the marine toads primary jobs is to help with eating insects. They do help with those um, maintaining stable populations and getting rid of a lot of those pests. So you can think about them as a pest control. Um, as far as here, we also can talk about the um, disadvantages of introduced species, you know, and the challenges that that can then create in their new habitats where they have been brought or introduced. So I guess the, the takeaway from that then is that any animal could technically be an invasive species if put in the wrong place. That is exactly right. Anything that is not where it is meant to be is, can, can be considered an introduced or a problem plant or animal. So uh, from personal experience, I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, when my wife and I went last year to New Zealand, we were surprised to find that there were many items that were possum fur. And that is become, because possums are an invasive species in New Zealand. They cause a lot of problems. And so one of the ways that they've found to, to take care of that problem is to use the possum as uh, you know, a, a way to, to make various clothing items and that sort of thing. So it was a little strange to see that since you know, obviously we've talked about possums here. In fact, we've, you have been you cared for one and showed, showed us uh, one of our possums here, another animal ambassador. So it's, it is an interesting matter of perspective that an invasive species is really just a matter of how you're looking at it and where you are. That's exactly right. And remember that everything has a job to do. And so when they're left in their natural habitats, they're um, specifically adapted for their particular role or their particular job. Okay. All right, so enough from, enough from me. Uh, let's ask some of your questions. Tiffany Garcia wants to know, on behalf of five-year-old Elijah, how high can they jump? They actually don't jump very high with, with this particular kind of frog. Like I said, they like to do small hops, and that's why in this container, you may see that they sometimes will climb, but they're not really trying to hop or jump out. Of the, and it's not much more than a foot high. Oh, yeah. And they looked like they were trying to, just getting their kind of forearms up. Oh, so you might notice, obviously, that Susie has put down some treats for them. Uh, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about what they're eating? Right now they're eating some crickets, and it's kind of fun to watch them eat because they use their tongue to catch their prey, and they kind of will aim 
their tongue for that and they're very, very quick. So you gotta be um, careful to watch. Uh, and there is one exceptionally brave cricket that has decided that the safest place to be is right between the two marine toads. So I don't know if he's just hoping that hiding in plain sight is gonna help him, uh, but maybe keep an eye out. Uh, and if you notice him uh, stick his tongue out, that cricket may be the first one to go. He may be depending on that camouflage as well. <laughs> Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, reiterate that uh, we would love to have all those comments and questions that you guys are typing down. And Ah, oh, I just missed one. Sorry, guys. Focus on the wrong thing. Anyway, so uh, we'd love to have all your comments and questions. And again, we do have that donate button down at the bottom of your screen if any of you are in a position to do so. Uh, any donations made through these live streams do directly benefit our emergency operations fund, which is really helping to defray the cost of us remaining closed during the ongoing health crisis. So all those donations are always very much appreciated. They are by no means necessary, but we do appreciate anyone who can make that contribution. So uh, looking down at the rest of these questions, uh, let's see. Ah, Katie Atkins would like to know, can other animals eat their eggs? That's a great question. And even their eggs are poisonous. And so there are not many things that can eat the eggs. There are not many things that can eat the toad in general. All right. Um, oh, Nancy Henson would like to know, do they have names? Um, no, we don't have names for them other than marine toad or cane toad, because what we would really like is for people to remember the species that they saw. Uh, I will give you permission. If you choose just for this live stream, you can refer to them as Jabba 1 and Jabba 2. We'll call the dark one Jabba 1 and the lighter one we Jabba 2. All right. Or, or Toad the Hut. We could go with that as well. In fact, if you have any suggestions for names that you think they should have for just for this live stream, I will happily uh, accept them and share them with Susie. Uh, let's see. So uh, Martha Boyle would like to know, can you get closer to my phone while you're talking. The only option I can do for that, Martha, would be for me to stand on the same side as Susie, but given the current situation, uh, we are not being advised to do that. Uh, so in the interest of, interest of social distancing, I'll just try my best to stay quiet so that you can hear Susie and maybe ask Susie if she doesn't mind to speak up just a little bit. Yeah, I can definitely try to talk a little louder. Um, and Susie, can you, we actually haven't properly introduced you to those uh, who maybe are unaware of what your role is here at the aquarium. So can you talk a bit about uh, what you do and, and how long you've been here? Well, I've been here at the aquarium for just over 25 years. And I work not only with our education ambassador animals, but also with some of our youngest visitors. So I work with um, our early childhood programs as well as just anyone who comes through the door. My real passion is to work with animals and to be able to help people understand and appreciate the animals. And if, I hope you're hearing the noise that these uh, marine tits are making when they actually open their mouth, because it is pretty funny. Um, and if anybody has, uh, has worked with Susie or whose kids maybe have been in one of Susie's classes, give us, give us a shout out so that I can share that with her, because I know that she would appreciate knowing uh, that some of her former little ones are watching. Uh, Rollin Jernigan Jr. wants to know, do frogs really give warts? That was something that uh, he heard back in the day. Oh, no, that's an excellent question. And a lot, it's an old wives' tale that if you pick up a toad in particular because of that warty or bumpy skin, that you are likely to come down with warts. But what we have found through science is that warts are covered, are um, caused by a virus not by the toads. So we do believe that potentially that old wives tale originated as moms didn't want their sons going out and catching lots of toads and bringing them home. So chalk it up to anti-toad propaganda then. <laughs> yes. Uh, looks like uh, my son, Henry, age four, would like to know if they can climb up trees and stick to stuff. That's a great question because there are some frogs that have those sticky toe pads that are excellent tree climbers. Our marine toad is not an excellent climber. He does not have any means of being able to hold on. He has no toe pads, he has no claws, and so he would not do very well at climbing trees. All right, so uh, a not so little one, uh, Katie Atkins would like to know on behalf of 66 year old Mike, uh, how long they live. That's another great question. In their natural habitats, it's estimated that they can live to be over 10 years of age, between 10 and 15. When they're under our care, they can live over 40 years. 
these two in particular have been with us here at the aquarium for about eight years and they were adults when they came into us and so we can estimate that they are between eight and ten years of age wow now uh what do they like to work with well that's a kind of interesting question. I think they're fun to watch and I just like learning about lots of different animals so I find them very intriguing. But they don't do a whole lot. They like to sit, that's what they would do naturally. They tend to sit in their um, water bowls and wait on food to come towards them. And then they get pretty excited about it. Or sometimes they let their food walk right by them and don't respond to it at all. This one cricket is uh, just, Pushing the limits of daredevilism. Um, about how much would they eat in a day? Well, or would they eat every day, actually, is maybe a better question. That is, that's a good question, too. And now, they do not eat every day. They, we feed them here a couple of times a week. And they eat mostly crickets here. And they will eat anywhere from 50 to 100 crickets apiece when we feed them. Wow. All right, uh, let's see. God, I know there are more questions coming in. I'm getting a little distracted listening to these toads eating. It's just, the noise is, it's just killing me. Uh, Jill Klein would like to know, do they get diseases? So we talked about the fact that, that they don't give us warts, but do they get diseases? Is that something you can answer? They can get different types of diseases. Any living creature can be susceptible to different types of things. Maybe not the same types of diseases that we're going to get, but they can have medical issues. And that's why we would work very closely with our veterinary staff so that if anything unusual um, ex presented itself with any of our ambassador animals or even our exhibit animals, then um, we would quickly get our vets involved. All right, uh, Carmen Hernandez Velasquez uh, wants to know on behalf of four-year-old Daniel, what sound does the toad make compared to the frog? Well, each different species has its own kind of noise that it makes. And marine toads make a sound that can sound like a, a ringing telephone, kind of a, a trill. Now, I haven't heard these. Most of the time, they make those noises during breeding season when a male is trying to attract the females to come to the breeding pools. Um, but it's kind of described as a trill ringing telephone. Maybe not the sounds that we have on our cell phones, but kind of the old-fashioned telephones. Okay. Uh, and have we talked about uh, doing no gender for these two? We do not know the gender on these. Okay. All right. Uh, Marcy Pug... I'm just... I'm sorry. Uh, Luca, age six, would like to know how many times a day do you feed the toads? We've already talked about that. Um, we really feed them a couple of times a week. But we try to make sure that when we do feed them, it's enough to last them. So they may not eat all of, the, all of their crickets at that time that we put the crickets in there. They may save some for later. We also can give them some enrichment where we can give them a cricket feeder. And they will learn to watch for those crickets to come out of the feeder so that they can be ready. Now, you say enrichment, and for those of you who are joining, who maybe this is your science hour and you're, you're not familiar with that particular word, this is a good chance for us to talk a little bit about uh, what enrichment is and why we do it. Enrichment is just a way of keeping their minds active. You know, we get bored just sitting around doing nothing, so we want to have things that we can do. Well, the animals would be the same way. They need things to do to keep their minds stimulated, to keep them um, kind of participating in natural behaviors. And so we can do that by, you know, trying to come up with things to make them have to figure out where is the cricket gonna come from. Um, and you remember that in their natural habitat, the crickets are not going to just come to them. And so they are going to have to actually hunt them. And so by setting up different um, things within their enclosure, then they can kind of simulate that same hunting. And so that's a form of keeping their minds active. Okay. Uh, Brooke Gorman says that Megan, age five, would like to know more about their tongues how, and how their tongues move so fast to catch the crickets. Well, their tongues are designed to help them to get their food, and so they can flick them out very, very quickly. Often, you know, frogs have different types of tongues. Some tongues are attached in the front of the mouth, some are attached in the back of the mouth, so that they can flip them out very quickly to catch their prey. Uh, Amanda Glenn would like to know, can you put your hand next to the toads again so they can kind of get an idea of the scale? 
They are big boys. They uh, are. Or girls. They are. Like I said, they currently weigh about three pounds. They can get to be about five pounds when they're fully grown, between four and a half and five pounds. Especially for a large um, female, the males tend to be a little smaller than the females. Okay. Uh, Jill Klein uh, is back with another question, which is, are they social animals? Not necessarily. They, don't, they will come together um, during breeding season when males will potentially be in the same pool, but they will, the female will lay the eggs and males will fertilize eggs from many different females. They don't mind being in close proximity to each other, but they're not really seeking out other marine toads either. What kind of habitat would they be, be, they be found in? They're primarily going to be a tropical frog. So they're going to like the tropics, the subtropics, and they tend to be in a forested area when they're, you know, when they first are hatched, the eggs are laid in the water and they go through the tadpole stage in the water and then they move out onto land and they are terrestrial or land dwelling for the rest of their life. Coming to the water, they will, like I said, soak in pools to get a nice drink of water. They soak that through their, the skin on their stomach and then to lay eggs, but they tend to stay where they can kind of burrow in the dirt. Um, they do not tolerate cold very well. And so they're not gonna be found where you have harsh winters or anything like that. And um, so you can find them in our country in places like Hawaii and South Florida, South Texas, some parts of South Georgia, but you're probably not gonna ever find them making their way too far north and um, where the weather gets cold. However, they can survive dry periods and they can survive short cold snaps by kind of burrowing in the, in the soil. Okay. So the, these are not a species you would find then in Chattanooga? At this point, no, we do not have them in Chattanooga. Okay. All right, uh, Clara, age seven, would like to know, why are they so big? Which is a great question. It's just an adaptation that they have that has worked well for them. By being large like this, it does increase the different types of food that they can eat, which helps the, them to compete with other species, whether they be other toads and frogs or even other insect eating species. Uh, William Grossvenner, Gross uh, sorry about that, but uh, wants to know, what are the pellets on the dark one's back? Those are actually just part of his skin, and those are the little warts or the bumps that, that, that often signifies a toad. There is some belief that there can be toxins or poisons that can be secreted from any of these little glands or little bumps on their backs. Okay. Uh, Renee Bendit would like to know, do they like to be handled? And you have not done much handling other than to, to take them uh, away from or prevent them from escaping, but uh, you're not handling them as a matter of course, but do they like to be handled? Not particularly because I'm much larger than they are. So if I go and reach in and grab them, that could potentially be to them, the same feeling as being picked up by a predator. And so, I, remember, I'm just some big giant to them. Um, they do tend to kind of huff and puff up and make themselves even bigger if they're handled or if they're uncomfortable with something. And I also try not to handle them just because of the sensitivity of their skin. Again, their skin works as a semi-porous membrane, meaning it allows some things to pass through including water, and if I'm handling them with dry hands, I could potentially damage their skin. Now, we've talked a little bit about, uh, we've used the word amphibian to refer to these guys, and uh, for those of you who are taking part in or following along with our Weekday Wonders uh, curated educational content that we've been releasing at on the aquarium's website, tnaqua.org, under the Aquarium at Home subsection, uh, we have a question of the day, and today's question is, what are characteristics of animals? And maybe this is a good time to talk about what are the characteristics of an amphibian that make it an amphibian? That's a great question. An amphibian, the word means kind of living a double life. And that's because the amphibians often start their life out in the water and then they go through a metamorphosis. And so like this little, this frog started out as a tiny little tadpole. And then as it changed into a toadlet, it then was moved out on land. So the second part of its land, it looks, or if its life, it looks completely different, lives in a different environment because it's no longer living in the water. It's now living on land. And that's one of the characteristics of an amphibian. Other characteristics of an amphibian often include that sensitive skin. Many amphibians have very wet or moist skin. Um, 
and it often works as that membrane, that semi-porous membrane allowing things to pass through. Okay. And that actually makes amphibians a pretty good indicator of the health of the environment that they're in. It does, because if they are living in an environment where the water is polluted, then a lot of times they're some of the very first animals because they're soaking that water directly through their skin into their bodies. They're some of the first animals to feel the effects of those um, pollutants. And so we call them an indicator species, meaning they indicate or tell us something about the health of the environment in which they're living. Okay. Uh, uh, Malika Wells would like to know on behalf of 12-year-old Morel uh, how the toads contract the virus that causes warts. So that we may have, that may be a miscommunication about how warts come about. That's not that they have the virus. They do not necessarily have the virus, and I don't know if they can contract the virus. It is humans that have the virus that gives us the warts, but it is not the frogs themselves. So they're just kind of scapetoads. They're the ones who are yes. blamed for it. They are the ones blamed for it. And oftentimes, again, the toads, because they have that warty looking skin, um, maybe partially where that originated. Uh, Val Tinsley would like to know, what do the different colorings and markings indicate? And you talked a little bit about uh, why they have that coloration, but if you don't mind going over it again. Well, their coloration helps them to hide or helps them to camouflage in their um, habitats. As far as the differences in the individual coloration now, it's just they're individuals. And just like you and I may have different hair color, or I may have more freckles than you, um, just they just have different skin variations or different skin um, pigmentations so that they have different colors. But they're all going to be some kind of variation of these browns, kind of olive gray colors that help them to blend in with the leaves that may be found rotting at the base of the trees on the forest floor because that's where they're going to spend most of their adult life. They look a little bit like, uh, the co coloration looks a little bit like a copperhead. Which, yeah, you know, which since... would again be in a similar type habitat, you know, often found on the forest floor and amongst the dead leaves and that modeled kind of patterning and things on them helps to break up their body shape again, kind of helping them to blend in. All right, uh, Adrian Profeta would like to know, are they good at swimming and also wishes us a happy May the 4th will, and may the 4th be with you as well. They can swim. Uh, they're decent swimmers. They actually have some webbing in their back feet to help them as they swim. But again, once they have moved out on land, they tend to stay on land except to come to the pools for breeding season. They're usually pretty shallow pools and they also will find water sources in which to sit and soak. So you'll often find them sitting in a puddle or in a damp place because they can even absorb that moisture through from the damp earth. Okay. Uh, now you mentioned breeding season a couple of times and uh, even though they're not found in this particular area, we have people watching from all over. So if they happen to be in your neck of the woods, uh, what is their breeding season? Their breeding season can be pretty much year round because remember they're living in these tropical environments where it is warm all the time. So generally an adult female can start producing eggs at about two years of age and after that she can produce multiple clutches and a clutch, a single clutch of marine toads can could range anywhere from 8,000 to 30,000 eggs and they can start hatching anytime from two days to about a week after the eggs have been laid and fertilized. Uh, Amanda Flat uh, would like to know on behalf of five-year-old Miles where they live, which you just answered. Uh, where are they from? So the, we covered that earlier, but if you don't mind talking about where they would normally be found. Natively, these this is a species that's found in Central America and um, northern South or the northern parts of South America, and you can find them in the most southern parts of Texas. Today, they've been introduced into areas like Hawaii, also into Florida, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally, just within as they've come across with lumber and produce and things like that, potted plants, they can hitch a ride. Just little stowaways then. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Marcus Barrett says, I want to hold one. Is that advisable? 
I do not recommend it. You know, you do need to make sure that you would wash your hands. They have to be nice and moist to, for the protection of the frog. But then do keep in mind that the, these particular frogs can secrete toxins through their skin or poisons through their skin. And so you'd have to make sure you cleaned your hands really well when you were finished. All right. Uh, Robert Daffrin, Daffrin says, hello, Susie from Richmond. So we got all the way up in Virginia. That's nice. Yeah, hi. Good to hear from you all. Uh, Jill uh, Rasner Klein would like to know, do they blink? They do blink. Um, they often have a third eyelid called a nictitating membrane that sometimes they will close just that eyelid instead of closing the eyelids where you can't see their eye because the nictitating membrane, you can see through it. Well, there you go. Those of you who are watching, you just saw that they do actually blink. We, we saw it happen. Proof positive. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got a lot of great questions coming in. Thank you all so much for making my job easy because I don't have to think of anything. Uh, Sue Draper would like to know, do they like to bask and what temperature do you do we keep them at here? I don't know that I've ever heard of them really called basking because they don't want to get too dry. It is important for them to keep, keep in those moist environments. They do like it nice and warm. So here they we keep them kind of at room temperature, which is gonna be around 70 sometimes a little warmer than that. And then they have a hot spot in their enclosure so that we can raise the temperature to keep them. And that's one of the things that these like to do is they like to sit in their water bowl just under their heat source um, so that they stay nice and warm. So creatures of, cre com creatures of comfort then. Yes. Just like Job of the Hutt, another <laughs> Star Wars reference. I'm gonna get as many of them in as I possibly can. It is Star Wars day after all. Uh, Sonia Keener would like to know on behalf of six-year-old Jace and three-year-old Luke from Chatsworth, how long their tongue can reach? Well, from where you can see this darker one sitting, and you can see a cricket over here in the corner, he could catch that cricket, but he would not be able to catch one on the other side of the cart. So it's going to be just a matter of a few inches for this particular species. But a few inches, when you think about how small they are compared to us, is actually, I mean, if your tongue were that long, that'd be a pretty long tongue. It would be. All right, uh, Donna Lewis would like to know, are they what we call bullfrogs? They are not bullfrogs. Uh, they are what's called a cane toad or a marine toad. They're a little different. The animals that are bullfrogs tend to be a little bit more aquatic than these. They tend to have a little, um, their skin is a little different. It's much smoother and it stays much wetter. Bullfrogs are gonna be you're gonna find them in the water and ride along those, the edges of the water, much more so than these. These will move in on inland a little bit more than that. They also make a very different call. The bullfrogs will make a call that kind of sounds like they're saying bubble gum. If you think about a real deep voice bubble gum, whereas these make kind of a trill sound. Uh, Sarah Siner says, hello, Susie, or hi, Susie. Hey, Sarah, happy birthday. <laughs> Uh, Virginia Kring would like to know how long do they live? And we, again, we talked about that earlier, but if you're tuning in a little bit later. In their natural habitats, it's not unusual for them to live 10 to 15 years. Under human care, then they can sometimes live more than 40 years. Now, is that typical for amphibians? Do amphibians tend to be longer lived, or is that, is that an outlier for amphibians? It kind of is dependent more on the species. Some species are going to live easily 10 years, and some are a little shorter lived than all right. Ah, so Martha Boyle would like to know why are they named marine toad when they're terrestrial? I don't necessarily know why they're called a marine toad. I know that at one time that was the part of their scientific name was marinus, which would, it was the specific epithet or the last part of their scientific name. They're also referred to as cane toads, which may be a little easier to understand just because they were introduced to help eat the insects in the sugar cane fields. Okay. Uh, Stacy uh, Buchholz says, hi, I'm watching from New York. I miss Tennessee. Well, Tennessee. Glad you're watching. <laughs> and Tennessee misses you too. All right, uh, let's see. Scrolling up here. Marcus Barrett uh, wants to know, how old are they and can I come and see them? They are right now at least eight years old. They've been here with us at the aquarium for eight years. And as soon as we are opened up again and it is deemed safe, we would love to have you come and meet the marine toads. 
And they would they would make an appearance in the aquarium uh, very similar in a very similar situation to how you're seeing them now. They would be on what we call a cart program. That's tr that's correct. Yeah, so these are not ones that you, again, you would not see these just in the course of walking through the aquarium uh, on a normal day. They would be something that'd be kind of a special treat to see them. And we hope we can welcome you back soon. Yes, as soon as that we're in a position to talk about our reopening plans, we will be sure to share those with, with everyone who is probably curious and anxious to get back, just as we are anxious to have you back. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Sarah is, uh, Sarah Siner's con is commenting with some some Star Wars puns, which I appreciate, which is, why did Anakin Skywalker cross the road uh, to get to the dark side? That, if I could laugh face emoji that, Sarah, I would. I'm glad to see someone is participating in Star Wars Day shenanigans. Uh, other than me. Uh, Tanisha Bafford wants to know, are they showing dominance by being on top of one another? So this is a little bit uh, earlier. I'm getting I'm a little delayed getting right. to this. And not necessarily showing dominance. Like I said, they kind of look out only for themselves, and so they don't necessarily care that another toad is there, and as long as it doesn't move, it'll walk right over top of it. All right. <laughs> okay. We're kind of showing differences in personalities right now, too. One is a little more active and moving around, whereas the other one is perfectly content to just sit very still. Uh, Sarah's back with another pun, which is, what programs do Jedi use to look at their files on the computer? Uh, Adobe Wan Kenobi. That is also pretty good. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Rebecca Rivers says, hi from Ohio. How often do you do the CART programs? Uh, which programs are your favorite? Yeah, well, we, when we are open and able to, um, we, are, we do CART programs on a daily basis with a wide variety of animals. And it's very hard for me to pick a favorite. Um, I really enjoy all of our animals and so I think the one that's my favorite is the one that I happen to have at that moment. Okay and what are some other examples of, of animals that would appear in a cart program if maybe you've never been here and been lucky enough to see one? We have a really wide variety of animals that come out on do our cart programs and that includes many different types of amphibians and things like our toads. We have different other, other species of frogs. We also have salamanders, um, like some of our newts. We have axolotls. Then we have a lot of reptiles, different types of turtles and lizards and snakes. Uh, we have things like tarantulas, that one that I really enjoy taking out, um, millipedes, cockroaches. Um, we have sea stars that come out and even some small mammals like our flying squirrels and our opossum. So if you've been watching these live streams, uh, you actually have been able to see the equivalent of many different cart programs because many of the animals that, uh, that Susie just mentioned have appeared on these live streams. So that is, that's pretty cool. Looks like we're running out of questions here and uh, the uh, darker of these toads looks like he or she might be getting a little bit antsy. So I will go ahead and wrap up this live stream, uh, but I will issue my usual reminder that if you are enjoying uh, this stream and would like to see any of our archived live streams, we're doing them every day at about 1 p.m. Monday through Friday. We do have those archived on YouTube as well as uh, assembled under that Aquarium at Home subsection of the aquarium's main page, which is tnaqua.org. And uh, that subsection also includes things like activity sheets you can print off. It's got some links to IMAX movies that you can watch and uh, some other things to keep yourself and your kids busy and distracted uh, and uh, maybe even educated a little bit while you're all stuck at home. We know that's difficult, so we're trying to do our best to make sure that that time that you're spending is as pleasant as possible. So uh, seeing a lot of thank yous directed your way, Susie. So thank well, you. Thank you very much for tuning in with us. All right. And thank you to our Marine Toads. And again, happy Star Wars Day to all of you. May the 4th be with you. And uh, if you don't mind, share this with your friends so that they can see these cool toads and our terrible Star Wars puns as well. And then uh, if any of you are in a position to do so or know anybody who might be who can contribute to that emergency operations fund that we've got a link to on the screen, we'd certainly appreciate any contribution that you are able to make, though it is by no means necessary or required. So thank you all very much, and we will see you tomorrow at about 1 p.m.